Well, good morning again. It's something I want you to think about trying to do this morning. It may be hard for some of us, but I want you to try and use your imaginations this morning a little bit. I want you to kind of immerse yourself in the text we're about to read and, and see yourself in the story as one of the participants. Because it's a, it's, a, it's a very powerful image of what's taking place here. And I know it's, you know, we call it Palm Sunday and we, we've all heard, many of us have heard this message before, some never before, but I want us to really think about the text today. And just as you hear the words read, just if you have to close your eyes, some of us have to do that, do that. And just imagine yourself in first century Palestine. This will be really hard. Imagine it being very warm and hot and dry. That might be hard. That would be hard for us right now because it is not hot nor dry, right? But imagine that and understand that in that setting of all that's going on, the Messiah comes. So let's go ahead and take a look at Luke 19, verses 28 through 40. If you would, follow with me in your copy of God's Word. If you are able, would you stand with me at this time as we look in Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 40. Everybody had a chance to find it in their copy of God's Word here. Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 28, he says, And after he had said these things, he was going on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And when he approached Bethphage and Bethany, near the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, there is, and as you enter you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you untied it, you shall say, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away went and found just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? Which seems kind of a strange question. Hello. They said, The Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus, and they threw their coats on the colt and put Jesus on it. And as he was going, they were spreading their coats on the road. As soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen. Shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Yet some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. Would you pray with me, Father? Thank you for your word. I thank you for the testimony that is laid out before us here by these events as they lead up to uh, so many things that mean so much to us as your children. And the reason that we can be here today comes from even what takes place here is you're preparing us and reminding us of all that is at stake. Father, use this time for your purposes. Speak to our hearts. Draw us close to you that we might hear and we might understand and we might apply these truths to our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So as I said, you're, you're in this large crowd. People are beginning to gather uh, for the Passover celebration that will be the next week, and that's why everybody, there's so many people in Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is not a, is a large city compared to most, but it was not built to handle the crowds that are coming, because they're coming from all over Israel to worship and to be a part of the Passover celebration. And as they're coming together, there's kind of this buzz in the air, there's excitement that Jesus is going to be there, and there's some thoughts about Jesus. Some people are excited that Jesus is going to be there, because they've heard that maybe Jesus is the one. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the one we've been waiting for. He's the one we've been seeking. He's the king. He's everything we dream for. Finally, finally we'll be free of Roman rule. He's going to take care of us and, and lead us to where we need to be and become the great nation we were. That's what was in the minds probably of many people that were gathering. I was thinking, oh, this Jesus is just one of those. Uh, he's just some teacher. He really doesn't know what he's talking about. He's maybe a little bit crazy. And others just had no idea. They'd heard the name Jesus. They'd heard the stories of the miracles. They'd heard about all these things that he had done. They were, they were curious. They wanted to see him. And so they all gathered together, this crowd in mass. And Jesus comes into the holy city. And we see what's kind of peculiar. Now, as I said, I want you to imagine yourself in this event, in what's taking place, to put yourself in the story, as, as a, a writer might say, to kind of really begin to picture it. And everyone's gathered around. Everybody's focusing, and they're singing, or they're singing, they're saying, Hosanna, blessed be the name of the Lord. They're praising God. They're, in fact, some are even taking palm branches, which was truly symbolic of peace and, and the hope that this king had come, and they were laying them down before Jesus as he rode in on a colt of a donkey, which, by the way, is prophesied in the Old Testament, okay? It's, it's, it's there. 
over 700 years before this happens, what's going to take place is prophesied. And he enters Jerusalem and he comes in and they're all excited. And they believe that, you know, they have all these thoughts about what the Messiah might be or who he might be and what this could mean to them. And yet we know the rest of the story. As they're screaming and shouting, Hosanna in the highest, some of those same voices, those same people that will shout Hosanna will later shout, crucify him. Give us Barabbas. Their hearts will turn. They will no longer focus on the Jesus whom at this time they worship. Their hearts will instead turn towards themselves. And brothers and sisters, that is the great struggle in the human spirit, is it not? The, most, the greatest enemy of our true worship of God is not the style of music, is not the time of the worship, it's not where we do it. The greatest enemy is ourselves because we can easily get and turn inward and focus upon our own needs and our own wants and what we think it should be. And when it doesn't fit our agenda, we become frustrated and even angry. And for some who were so excited about Jesus coming, so excited about the Messiah, so enthralled with the moment, their hearts would turn. And often wonder as, as the Savior rides in on that donkey and all that's going on, and I'm sure the disciples are strutting at this time. You know what I mean by that? Some of you are too young to know what strutting is. It's something guys do when we get really confident. And so they're probably thinking, yeah, this is what we've been waiting for. This is it. Jesus is king. Woohoo! All right, it's going to be good now. This is what we've been doing all this stuff, all those late nights and all this stuff, so we can be a part of what Jesus is going to do. They're going to all follow him, and we're going to be, we're going to be with the top, with the king. We're going to be on the king's advisory council, whatever that means. We're going to be right with him. All we're, This is it. We're excited. They have no idea. Jesus knows. Jesus has told them time and time again what's going to happen. But they've kind of tuned it out because we do that pretty well as people, don't we? We don't like to hear bad news. And even when we know things are coming and we know that our actions may lead in a negative direction, things aren't going to work the way we want it to and all those kind of things happen, we still like, ah, that's not really going to happen to me. That's not going to happen. And we kind of push it to the side. And the disciples are kind of doing the same thing here. They, they're so caught up in the moment, in the celebration, that it's all about this. And they're just kind of, yeah, and everything's wonderful and they're excited and it's a great day. By Friday, it's not going to be such a great day, is it? Because you see, we know what happens next. We know all that this leads to. We know where this is going. So does Jesus. And it's all in God's plan. Everything. And every person that was there is there for a different reason. But you know, there's a story with all those faces. Have you ever thought about that? A lot of times you look at a crowd and you see a crowd. You see a mass of people, but I can look across this audience this morning and I see people and I can see your faces. You're not, you're not the mass that Jesus is facing in the text. And I know behind each face is a story, is, is somewhere where God is leading you and God is on a path with you and God is directing you and it's easy to follow him and sometimes it's hard to follow him because he wants us to go a direction that sometimes is difficult. And for the disciples here, they're really trying to figure all this out. They've, they're trying to figure out what Jesus means by saying he's the Messiah. What, what does that really mean? You say, well, Jesus never said he was the Messiah. Oh, yes, he did. When Jesus calls himself the Son of Man, brothers and sisters, that is a blanket statement that he is the Messiah. That is understood when he says that. He is not playing games. He's not trying to be coy. He's, not, he's just saying, I'm the son of man. And, and they know who the son of man is. They understood that. And there are other times in the scripture, you look in the text when he, just, he says that he is he. And they, there are others that are frustrated. And you notice, even in the middle of this celebration, the people that always mess up the party are there. Don't you love folks like that? The people that always want to bring things down? Does that happen in your, when you have a celebration? You, anybody awake out there? Just checking. You've got everything going on. You've got everybody together. And then somebody brings a kind of an attitude that is negative into the situation. And so we have in the middle of this, this great celebration, we have the Pharisees at the end there. They say, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Tell them to be quiet. They, they, they shouldn't be saying these things because these guys understand what these people are saying. It's not veiled. It's, it's, it's very, they are declaring Jesus to be the Messiah. They are declaring him to be the one that is promised. 
He is the Messiah. And they may not fully understand all that means yet, but they are simply declaring it. And the Pharisees say, tell them to be quiet. And what does Jesus say? They can, they can, they can be quiet, but you know what will happen? Rocks are going to cry out. Nature will rejoice. It will proclaim the truth of who I am. Now, there's a lot in that thought. I just want to kind of camp here for just a moment to help you and I understand who we are as followers of Christ and what our role is in this great picture, in this grand adventure we call life. Because ultimately what our role is, if we're followers of Christ, is we will be those who will praise his name forever in his presence in heaven. A lot of you say, well, I don't sing very well and my musical ability is limited. You know, that's okay here. But in heaven, you're not going to have to worry about that. You're going to have the greatest ability to sing and praise, and you're not going to get tired. Because you're not going to be tied to this body anymore. You're not going to simply, it's not going to be about the way life functions. It's going to be completely different, and you're going to be able to sing and shout and yell in ways that you never imagined to sing praises to your king. Because that's why you and I are made. That is the purpose of our creation. That's why we were created. We were created to praise our king. And we'll be able to do that with our whole heart, our whole life in ways that we really can't try. We, we try to do it here, but it will be done in a way that is just overwhelming. But you know what you can do here while you're here now is do the best that you can with what you got. I know for some of us that's a challenge, right? I'm not the only one that has a challenge vocally. I understand that, and that's okay. You know what the scripture says, right? Does it say sing on key? If you can't sing on key, don't sing. Isn't that what it says in the scriptures? No, what does it say? Make a what? Okay, we all know that, right? And then, but then when we sing, it's like, praise God. Isn't it? You don't want anybody to hear you because you might offend them. Well, let me give you an encouragement here. You are not singing for them. Are you? You're not singing to be heard by the person next to you. It's not, it's not, you're not trying to offend them. You're singing, you're not singing to them either. It's not about them. They are basically, when we are together, gathered, and we are singing praises to God, we're just doing it as a, as a unit, as a, as a family of believers. We are singing that, and all of our focus and attention is on the king. Does that make sense? And that's the one to whom we sing. And that's the only one whose opinion of our singing matters. And if you're one of his kids, he doesn't care what your tonal quality is, right? You say, oh, yeah, he does. No, he doesn't. You know when the biggest crowds usually are in church? Whenever we have the kids sing. The parents come out. In the old days, I'm going to date myself, it used to be the camcorder would rise. Anybody remember the camcorders? You know those little things? Now you just pull, I don't have my mind sitting on the pew for, for a reason because it makes weird things with the sound, but we pull out our phones, or our tablets, and that's how we videotape because people do it and it doesn't matter where you are. When the kids get up there, there come the tablets and the phones, don't they? Because we want to video it and that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. And why does it, does it matter to us whether our children sing every note perfectly? Parents. We would love that, but does it really matter? No. If that doesn't mean that much to us, how much more does our singing to the king mean to him? How do you feel? What kind of emotions stir in your heart when you watch your child perform or, or sing? Whether it's here or whether it's a school function, whatever it is, what, what, what kind of wells up in you a little bit? A little pride, right? In a good way. You're encouraged. You get excited. You get happy. There's just something about it that you want to hear them. And it, there can be 40 kids lined up, and what, you're laser-focused on the one that's yours, aren't you? You don't think the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, can do that? You don't think he's encouraged by your voice? That when you sing praises to him, regardless of how it sounds in the tonal quality that musicians and, and artists would understand and, and, and critique, he doesn't care because one of his kids is singing. One of the kids is singing, I'm all over this. I'm going to listen. And that's why Jesus says that to these guys. See, we could be quiet. And if we're quiet, the rocks are going to sing. And there's an old youth chorus. It was a children's chorus. You might have heard it. Going to let no rock. 
Anybody remember that stupid song? I mean, silly song? But it's a good, it's got a good message. It comes from this text. I'm not going to let no rock cry in my place. No. I'm going to sing my praises to the Lord. It's not going to, and that's the reality of it. They, they know that. They don't understand that. They're, see, they're all caught up in, in the pretense and the circumstances, and they want to make sure everything is just so, these guys do, because they're rule keepers. And there's nothing wrong with being a rule keeper. I'm a rule keeper. That's one of my problems. I tell people all the time, I am a recovering Pharisee. Always. And I'm aware of that. And it frustrates me to death sometimes. Sometimes I, I, I look at myself and like, what is wrong with you? But there's nothing wrong with the rules. And you see, the Pharisees were caught up in the rules so much that they missed the big picture. And I can do that too, and so can you. They didn't see what was going on. They didn't understand it. They, 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 they had it pigeonholed into a certain thing that it had to be because it's always been that way. They almost were Baptist. That they missed it. And the disciples missed it, didn't they? I mean, they enjoyed the moment. I mean, it was cool walking around with the king of kings. And, you know, everybody was, finally, everybody recognized who Jesus. Finally, we get our due. Finally, it's going to happen. It's going to be good from now on. Oh, yeah, right. They had no idea what was coming. But they're enjoying the moment. And Jesus is the only one who understands what's going on. He knows where this leads. And it leads to the cross. And all that will take place at the cross, all the horrors, all the pain, all the anguish, all the suffering, all that will take place at the cross. Because the cross reminds us of something very, very important. The cross reminds us of how horrible our sin is. You know, sometimes my sin's not so bad because it's my sin, right? It's not as bad as everybody else's, right? I didn't do what the guys or girls in prison did, right? So I'm not that bad. One sin. One. Trivial as it may be in our high, in the way we view it, was enough for Jesus to endure the torture, the humiliation, the suffering, the pain, and ultimately the death so that my deliverance could be bought. That's how serious the creator of the universe takes sin. It is my sin and your sin that puts him on that cross. That cross should always remind us of what sin does. And the only way we can be delivered from it. There's no other path. There's no other way that, you know, I can be good. I can go to church. I can do all these nice things. But all that does is just pad my resume and make me just as much a hell-bound person as it was before. The only thing that makes a difference between that path and the path that the Father has for me is when I trust Jesus. And because of what Jesus has done in the, and what he has accomplished on the cross, then I have salvation. But it cost. The Scriptures teach a principle that is relived over and over again. The Scriptures say, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And it begins in the garden, you remember? After Adam and Eve sinned, when they ate of the, the tree that they were told not to, they had one thing to do. One thing. Did you get that? That's how many. One. And what did they do? The one thing they weren't supposed to. Does that not sound like us? That's what we do. You remember, you said, well, you know your kids. You've done, I, I remember as a child, my sisters, my parents would tell us as they'd, you know, leave me in charge. That was scary. And they would leave me in charge and they said, don't do anything. They'd usually give us one or two rules and we'd usually break at least one of them. Always. And that's what we do as people. And yet God knows this. This isn't a surprise. In this, you know, it, he knows it's going to happen, and so he has a plan for our redemption. That plan is Jesus. And as he redeems us and gives us that hope, it's all about his purpose, his plans, his direction, and what he's trying to accomplish. And in the garden, after they sinned, what did they have to do? Well, they, what, what, remember what they said to, to God when God comes to the garden, what are they doing? After they've sinned, where, where are they at? You remember? Anybody remember that? You can look it up in Genesis later. But remember, they're, they're hiding from God when he comes in the garden. He always comes to the garden in the cool of the day to talk to them and just spend time with them. And what are they doing? They're hiding. They're hiding behind, and they've got fig leaves over them, and they're, they're kind of covering themselves. And he goes, what, what, what are you doing this for? 
Well, we're naked. Who told you that? Uh, long pause. Always a problem when there's a long pause, right? When we're asked a question, that's never good. That means we're trying to think up or make up an answer. And then he goes, ah, did you eat of that tree I told you not to? Uh, uh, and of course, Adam, guys, classic, this is what we do, don't we? What does he do? He blames Eve. Well, you know, but it doesn't just blame Eve. Here, listen to Genesis. This woman that you gave me, so he's not just blaming Eve, he's blaming God too. It's all your fault, not my, because we don't take fault for anything, right? We can't take responsibility. You don't believe me? Look at politics. Nobody takes responsibility for anything. And we're, that's a human thing. It's what we do. And even in that moment, they do that. And they end up being re removed from the garden. Some saw that as cruel, but that was the greatest gift of mercy God could have ever done because if they eat of the tree of life after they've eaten the tree that was in disobedience, do you know what that means? There's no hope. We're in an eternal state of disobedience to God. We are forever separated from God. Forever. So he kicks them out of the garden to save them, to give them a chance. And then in order to clothe themselves, what do they have to do? Those cozy, cut, fluffy little animals that were around them, you know, everybody was happy. You know, it was just, you know, everybody was vegetarian. Yeah, all that ends. And they have to kill the animals to clothe themselves, to cover themselves. And that principle is there. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Blood has to be shed. That's, that should remind us how serious sin is. Just as the cross ultimately reminds us how serious sin is, that is the only way God could bring us back into a right relationship with him was to restore us, was to send his son. And as Jesus comes down those streets in Jerusalem, those people don't even have a clue what's going on, but he knows exactly what awaits him. He knows how it's going to turn. He knows how it's going to change as he sees every face and knows every story. He realizes that those same people that sing hosannas will want to kill him. And you know what amazes me? At any moment, he could have stopped it. At any moment. The first time a Roman soldier takes that cat of nine tails and he's starting to wail back, and that first time it shreds the back of his skin and he feels that. You think getting hit with a switch is bad? Or the belt? It has no comparison to what he went through with just one stroke. Now, in the movie, they do 49. That's probably not true. That's a Jewish thing. The Jews were the ones that only did 49. They would do 50 minus 1. They would never do more than that. The Romans had no limit. In fact, many times, the men that were flogged died in the flogging. They never made it to the cross. They died there on that post because those guys got into it. And they, I mean, they enjoyed what they did. And all Jesus had to do was say, I'm done. I can't do this, Father. It's too much. It's too much. Can't do it. It's not worth it. And you realize that that whole place could have been vaporized and everybody there would have been gone. But what did he do? He took every stroke. Every single one. He never, ever wavered. And then they bound him up and they marched him and made light of him, and they humiliated him, and they were cursing him and saying things to him. They were punching him and doing all kinds of things that it really doesn't, we, we can see it in our minds. We can kind of grasp it in what we've seen dramatized out. All that humiliation is taking place, and every one of those, some of those same people, those same people were there, and now they were doing this because that's what we are. We are broken. We are depraved. We are lost. We are sinners apart from Jesus Christ. It's what we do. You know, the one thing I do best is sin, and so do you. We can do that easy. That's a default position for us. And they went into it, and they were doing all those things because of their anger and their desire to destroy him, and they thought they were doing what they needed to do to, to get out whatever it was that was, they were dealing with, and yet Jesus takes it. Ultimately, they lay him on a cross. 
Now, the first time a nail were to go into my wrist and pin me to a board, I'm done. How about you? I am done. You ever stepped on a nail? You know, that's a nice little carpenter, what, you know, roofing nail, whatever. Those hurt. Can you imagine having, I mean, these, these weren't the nice refined nails that we buy at the hardware store. They were very coarse, they were large, because they were to hold human weight and pin it. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, they, they, didn't, they never nailed here, because what happens here? This will shred. They have a spot between here. There's a spot in your wrist. The Romans were professionals at this. They knew exactly what they were doing, and, and they nailed that in there, and it, it just jammed it through. And they were good, and maybe, maybe a good guy could do it in two or three strikes. Big guy, you know how hard it is to hammer a nail into wood? Imagine going through bone and flesh. And the Savior took it. At any moment, at any moment, he could have ended it. Never, ever forget that. And then they stretched him out and they put that cross, they hung him on that cross and he hung there as a displayed all, out of humiliation, he's hanging there, as a reminder of his crimes. They even put a little sign over his head to mock him. This is the one who's the king of the Jews. They were trying to mock him, and the Jews got upset about the sign because say, have it say th that it says, it says, I believe in Matthew's gospel, where it says, have it says that he said, he no, no, what we put, and, and they said, what is done is done. This is your king. Look at your king. And the Romans thought this was a pretty good deal. They were enjoying it. Some of the Jews were probably enjoying it because, well, the guy got his. Son of God, huh? Really? Really? And imagine the hurls and the insults and all that he went through. That all came from Palm Sunday. That all led up to that point. It was all culminated there. And he suffered. And every holiday, he watched his friends abandon him and leave him. They, they cowered in fear. Many of them, most of them, we don't know, they didn't even show up. Except for one, whom he gives the responsibility to take care of his mother. That's it. The rest of them, they're, where are they at? Where's Peter at with his sword? I'll be with you to the end. You remember that? I remember that. I'll follow you. I'll do no matter what. Others will leave you, Jesus, but I'm right with you. I can relate so much to Peter because I can be braggadocious sometimes and think I'm all that, and then I realize I'm pretty much like Peter. I'm kind of a wimp. And he did all that because it had to be done. It was the only way that you and I could be made right with our Creator. The only way. And after all those hours of suffering and all that pain and all the mockery and all the different things he went through, he finally gave it all up. You remember? It says it in the text. He cries out to God and they get confused, think he's talking to Elijah. They don't, because nobody can pay attention. It's windy out there, I guess. I don't know. It's, pretty, it's gotten pretty rough out there. Because after that happened, what happened? Do you remember the... Sky got dark, it got kind of, looked kind of bad, it looked like a storm was going to come in, it got kind of rough. Because the Creator was showing His disgust of the situation. Because His Son had now become my sin. And yours. So He didn't just die a revolutionary's death, He died a sinner's death. That was my death. And yours. That was my sin and yours. All the sins, all the horrible things that are done in humanity that they display on the evening news that we read about in the books, the things that have been done from the beginning of human, recorded human history to the end, all of that horror, all that junk in one moment is put on one man, the God-man, Jesus, the only one that can take it. He literally becomes sin for all of us. And I believe that was a far greater burden than the nails and the physical pain, I think that, that becoming sin and the separation from the Father in that moment was greater than anything else he endured. And he did it for me. And he did it for you. And he did it out of great love. For his See, the whole reason Jesus does everything he does isn't for my kumbaya moments. It's out of great love for his heavenly Father, his Father, my King.
He loves the Father so much that he would rather suffer and die than rebel against him. And then it happens. As he dies, what happens in the temple? Never let that image forget your mind. They try and dramatize it, but the temple veil is stripped. It's not a cloth. It's several inches thick because it separates people from the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy of Holies. No one goes back there but once a year, and it's a high priest after all the sacrifices and all that. You know, you know the story. And it's shred in half from top to bottom. It didn't unravel. It's torn by the hand of God. As a reminder, and I think a living testimony to us, that no longer are you separate from me. No longer do I need sacrifices and ritual. My son is the ultimate sacrifice. My son is the lamb of God. My son is the one who has delivered his people and brought them to me and made a way for you, the only way there is, right in that moment. Never, ever forget that. He says, here it is, a living demonstration. He did it. And the ground shook, and it was quite a mess. I'll let you look at the scriptures. There's a lot there, a lot more than I can share in these few moments. And the king of kings is dead. Dead as dead can be. Not a, not a, living, not a, not a, not a single tissue, not a single cell is alive anymore. He is dead. And darkness falls. And in that moment, it looks like the enemy is one. I imagine in the other parts of the other realm, in hell itself, I imagine they were having a party. We got him. It's done. It's over. We won. We finally showed God who's boss. I'm sure Satan was excited. Look what I've done. Look what, how I've accomplished this. Isn't this amazing? And they were probably all congratulating themselves, the demons. They were getting down, and they were just having a good time. And celebrating all that was going on in that moment. And like a lot of folks who never realize what's going on, they didn't even realize they were already beat in that moment. Because you see, the victory that Jesus wins is not the resurrection. No. That's, that's God saying, oh yeah, baby. You didn't think God said it that way, did you? Maybe he does. I don't know what he says. I'm not God. So he, who knows how he says it? Carl Barth says it more, you know, appropriately. It is God's ultimate yes. Okay, whatever. That's good. The victory is won at the cross. Because that's where sin is defeated. The penalty from my sin and everyone that's ever lived sin is paid for in that moment. Jesus has taken it all. It's all over. It's all done. There's now a way for us to the Father that was not there before, but it's now there because of what Jesus has done. There was, a, there was foreshadowing of the way. They knew what the way would be, but it had not been accomplished until Jesus did what Jesus did, and only, only Jesus could do. No one else can do what he did. And all those people in the crowd didn't get it, did they? And if we'd been there... We wouldn't have gotten it either. We got caught up in the moment like the disciples. And maybe if we'd been in the crowd at the trial, as they, or the mock trials, as Pilate presented the pin before the people and all the people started screaming out, crucify, maybe if we'd been in that crowd, we might have joined in. I don't know. I hope not, but you never know. We'd like to think, no, I'd have been the one that said, no, quit that, quit that. That's not right. Give, Barabbas is the one that deserves to die. But mob rule is powerful. Mob rule can turn good people into dark people in their soul, can it not? We've seen it in our own land when it takes control and causes horrible things to happen, things that are inhumane, things that are sickening when the mob is in control. But even when we think, you know, what I, what I am always amazed by in Scripture that even when it looks like it's over, it's not. Now I'm going to leave you here because you know what next Sunday is and what we celebrate next Sunday. And I want to let us celebrate that, but I want us to realize the cost 
of my sin and your sin. What it cost the creator of the universe to redeem us, to make us right. It cost him his child, his only son, and not just his life, but a suffering and an inhumanity that is hard to fathom and picture in our minds. And yet he did it. He did it. And nobody was excited on Friday. Except maybe the soldiers and some of the Jewish priests who were excited. Yeah, we got him. He's done. We can wash our hands of that, Jesus. It's over. This thing's done. This whole Jesus thing. We don't have to worry about him. It's all over. We won. It's over. Yay, right? It's over. That's what they were thinking. They were joining in with the demons in hell, screaming and getting excited, having a party, ready. It's over. We have won. And they didn't realize that the clock was ticking. Oh, yeah, it was ticking. Sunday was coming. The day that changes everything was coming. The reminder for us that God is bigger than death. Jesus has just shown us he's bigger than sin. But he's even bigger than death. And that same God is reaching out to every one of us today, showing us his love by his son on the cross. He's shown us what it means, what he lo- how he loves us and cares for us. But he's also reminding us, boys and girls, this is what your sin does. What do you and I do with that? How do we come to God now? The same way we always come to God. On our knees. Would you pray with me, Father? Thank you for your word. I thank you for the testimony of this event, all that it means, all that it says to us, and more. And Father, I pray that our hearts and minds would be reminded as we go through the week and all the different things that we look into and are reminded of, of what our sin cost you, what the price is for our redemption, what it takes to bring us back, how serious our sin is. Though they may seem trivial to us and may seem like of no consequence, Father, it is serious business because our sin separates us from you. And I pray, Father, that you draw our hearts to you as a reminder of that, that you draw us to you, that we would hear your voice calling out to us. And whether we are a follower of Christ yet or not, that you would call us to yourself and speak to us. And we'd get right with you. That we would admit our sin instead of hiding it. Instead of excusing it, instead of justifying it, we would admit it and bring it to the cross. Father, bless this time and use it for whatever purposes you have planned. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.